Uh, I'm very excited to introduce Shoy uh, Liang. He is uh, speaking on behalf of Jian Ma, um, who is a Stephanie Lane Professor of Computational Biology in the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and um, uh, Shao Eng Li is a Lane Fellow, a postdoc in uh, Dr. Jian Ma lab in the Department of Computational Biology, School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, he earned his uh, PhD at uh, Rice University. I'm very excited uh, to have you here today, and his uh, talk title is Large Language Models in Computational Biology, a Primer. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Here, let's get started. So the talk is about biology, and what is biology? The textbook definition is the scientific study of life. But what do people really talk about when we say biology? Here is a word cloud generated from the biology term on Wikipedia. And what we can see here is the object we are studying, the life, like animals and plants. And there are also the topics like genetic evolution. There are also the molecules like genes, DNA, and proteins. But the biggest term here is cell. That's the most frequently talked concept here, and it's the basic unit of life. So here this talk will be about computational molecular and cell biology. The molecules in the cell will uh, will determine the structure and process of the cellular life. And uh, this study is also about their roles in living organisms, how the cells um, have their functions in living organism. And the center pillar of this area is the central dogma. What the central dogma says is that the DNA or the genome, basically all the genes and also other things in the DNA, is the encyclopedia of life. And the RNA will be transcribed from the DNA. That's basically a photocopy or a transcript of a few pages of the very thick book of DNA. And those photocopies will then guide the production of proteins. Those will actually perform their functions in cells. So the way we study the DNA and RNA is through sequencing. Sequencing is the technology to determine the actual content of the DNA or RNA. And it was actually very expensive at the beginning of this century. That's when the Human, project, human Genome Project was done. The Human Genome Project sequenced the whole human genome, and it took 2.7 billion at that time, that would be 5 billion US dollars today. But at today, it, it actually only takes less than $1,000 to sequence the whole genome of a person. So this leads to the introduction of biological big data consortiums. A direct extension of the Human Genome Project is the 1,000 Genomes Project. So in most people, 99.9% .9 of the genome are just the same. But what's the most interesting is the very tiny difference. That determines the difference between among people in different continents, and it also leads to the discovery of the reason of many genetic diseases. So we have this project to sequence 1,000 genomes around the world. And beyond DNA, we are also interested in the RNA content in cells. That's because most of the cells will have exactly the same DNA content in human except for cancer cells. So the Human Cell Atlas is a consortium to sequence the cells in different organs and tissues, find out which genes are being transcribed into RNA in those cells and find out uh, what lead to the functions of those cells or malfunctions in disease cases. And there are 50 millions of cells get sequenced. For each cell, we will have 20,000 of the genes 
the information of the 20,000 of genes in it, and these cells are from more than 7,000 7, donors. Also, beyond healthy human donors, there are also consortiums for diseases. Most prominent one might be cancer. The H10 is the Human Tumor Atlas Network. There are more than 1,000 cases get sampled, and for each sample, we usually have 5 to 10 kilo cells. And of course, all the cells will have these genes. Biological data is unique in, in their complicated nature. Although we have very large data, but there are also, these data are, are also very heterogeneous. They're diverse and noisy. The reason is that these data are collected from different organs, different tissues, they are from different donors, and they are processed by different facilities or laboratories. So there are usually biological differences between the donors. They can be of different age, different sex, and the different labs can also have technical variances in their, when they carry out the protocols to sequence those cells. And the data are also usually high dimensional. When there are sequences or vectors like DNA sequences, protein sequences, they are usually very long. For example, human genome have three billion nucleotides. And they can also take the form of matrices. For example, the RNA data are usually cell time stream matrices. Those will be like tens of thousands times tens of thousands matrices. And uh, we also have matrices that characterize the interaction between the pairs of genome regions or between protein regions. They can also take the form of a tensor that's even higher than matrix when we have the measurements either over time or over different patient samples, different diseases. So now let's first talk about genome genomic sequences or DNA sequences. So this is a visualization of the DNA, and what really matters here is the information carried by it. Basically, a long sequence of ACTG, and that can be a 3 billion basis long. And we want to know what this information means in biology. We want to predict the outcome of these DNA sequences. Are they genes? Are they regions that control the transcription of the genes, and also we want, to, we want some insights about the functional impacts when there are perturbations on these things, for example, when mutations happen. Will something lead to cancer, or will something just benign? So one task we want to do on these sequences is to find out some functional regions. For example, promoter regions or transcription factor binding regions so the promoter is this region on the DNA, and what it does is it's an important factor in transcription. That's how DNA become RNA. So the RNA polymerase has a function of generating DNAs from their, generating RNAs from the DNA templates. And it needs to find the promoter region to bind on to carry out this function. And these promoter regions will have some patterns, of course, but it's an elusive part pattern for human to easily find. So the hope is that we can use machine learning models to find some unified patterns among all different genes. And similarly, there are many other molecules that, that control the expression of these genes. Those are called transcription factors. And they also have their specific binding sites and we also want to find where these sites are. Another topic is called RNA splicing. So when the DNA is transcribed into RNA, there are regions that will be kept in the mature mRNA, and there are regions that will be chopped off. And the task here is to, just by looking at the sequences, determine which regions will be chopped off, and those regions are called the introns.
And here, people pay attention to the large language models or foundation models because these models have the capacity to be pre-trained on a lot of different data and then carry out functions or tasks on a diverse, on diverse downstream tasks. So the reason people want to use this model is that we have very diverse data from different sources, and we have very diverse tasks. So we are hoping that there's a unified model to, to deal with these problems. So this is a model get introduced in this area. It's called DNA BERT. It's one of the first attempts to, to apply large language models to DNA sequences. So if you think about it, the DNA sequence is somewhat like human language. First of all, it's a sequence of letters, although we don't really have words there. And the, so the first task is to actually find some words from it. And the easiest way is actually the KMER tokenization. It's just to chop the long sequence into K letters, K letters, K letters that are overlapping windows. So this, will, this would be a 3 mer tokenization. And the model is pre-trained on human reference genome and then fine-tuned on the specific tasks I just talked about, these three tasks, promoter region prediction, binding site prediction, and splice site prediction. There's also another task that's to find out the outcome of mutations. And of course, the camera tokenization is just the simplest way, and people are talking about, are there better ways to do this? A problem of the overlapped windows is that when we use masks to masked sequences to train the model, the overlapping window will leak information through the mask. So people talk about, can we use non-overlapped mask, non-overlapped cameras? The answer is probably no, because if you have two sequences that are basically the same except for the first letter, when you use these non-overlapped tokens, you will get completely different token IDs, and that probably won't work. So the group of people who invented this DNA BERT2 use this byte pair encoding strategy. What it does is to, from the original sequence, it finds out the segments that are very frequent and iteratively combine them into a single word and put it into the vocabulary. So this will result in a sequence that's just one-fifth the original length, and it also prevents the information leakage because these things are not overlapping. And over the years, people have, actually just over the last four to five years, people have introduced a lot of different models based on different machine learning architectures, and they have vast different number of parameters, and they can carry out most of the tasks I just introduced. But some of them will have different flavors, and they also have advantages on different tasks. But I guess no one would say that this is a closed case, and people are still exploring what's the best strategy to, to represent the biological content into something like human language, or just language and uh, find new models to better understand those biological language. So now let's switch the gear to single cell transcriptomics. That's basically the RNA contents of genes in cells. The RNAs are called transcripts because they are the transcripts from the DNA. And what we have is basically a matrix that is cells times genes, where each entry says how many copies of, the, copies of RNA from a gene is from that cell. So two most common tasks in this, uh, for this 
matrix is cell embedding and cell types and states and notation. Cell embedding is something like this. It's basically something like PCA, but it's actually a nonlinear uh, dimensional, dimensional reduction method called UMAP. Each dot here is a cell, and the distance of the cells are determined by the similarity of the cells in this matrix over the genes. So we can directly see that there are large clusters of the cells, and we want to know what cells these are. This is the immune cell data set, so it has things like T cells, B cells. These are the major cell types we want to determine. And within each major cell type, we have these different colors of cell subgroups. These are also things we are interested in, because things like T cells, we will have the naive cells that are not mature enough to, to kill those pathogens. We also have the effector T cells that are actively doing their work. We also have T cells like exhausted T cells who have endured too much and they are not functioning at that point. This is a big topic in cancer because people are all talking about immune therapies and it's important to direct the cells to, to a state that they will kill the cancer cells. These are all the things we want to figure out. And the cell embedding is very important because the cell types and cell states, many of them are not predetermined. We don't have that much labeled data for those. And in biology, we want to figure out, we always want to figure out new things that are new cell states we didn't know before. So we need the cell embeddings to be very rich, very representative, to be able to find some small clusters of cells. So on the gene side, we also want to discover things like gene programs or gene regulatory networks. That's how genes regulate the, one gene regulates the expression of other genes. This is also important in cases like cancer, because in cancer there are genes get perturbed in mutations, and that leads to the malfunction of cells and their uncontrollable uh, proliferation. That's the cause of cancer. Another topic is batch integration. That's directly linked to the diversity I just talked about, about the biological data. The data are from different patients, different organs, and different facilities. So when you directly visualize the data, what you have is usually something like this. The cells are pretty much clustered by the donors or the organs, not actually the cell types. So there's a big topic in this area of how to generate embeddings that are more agnostic to the batches and reveal more information about the cell types or cell states. Another thing we want to do is perturbation predictions. Perturbation itself is a Nobel Prize winning technique. That's the one called CRISPR. They perturb some genes um, and then see what will happen in other genes. The problem here is that it's very expensive to do, especially for all 20,000 genes. And also the effect, the effect of perturb, perturb those genes is not just additive, so we also need to do combinatorial perturbations for maybe two or three genes, and it's apparently impossible to try all the possibilities. So people are eyeing on computational methods to make those predictions and find some, in, some, um, some interesting targets to actually do experiments on. So in order to carry out all these tasks, people again try to find a way to use the LLM-like models in this context. This is, this is a bit harder than DNA sequences because the cells we have or the matrix we have is very different from human language or any language. They are not sequences. 
the orders of the genes are not naturally meaningful, and the matrices we have are usually just ordered by their alphabetical order. And if you permute these matrices, we're not expecting any differences. So there are a few strategies people are using. The first one is just ranking the genes by some biological meaningful way. For example, the gene former is basically taking the gene expression from the biggest to the smallest and use that to order the genes. Of course, there are normalization and scaling in this process, but it's basically the most important one to the least important one. And the genes will also have their own embeddings or encodings from other biologically meaningful content. And there are other ways to do this. For example, the SDGPT, they will give a encoding for the expression values, the counts of the RNAs, and add those up with the, with the gene encodings and use that as the input to the language models. And they will pre-train these models on millions of cells and then fine-tune these models to specific tasks. There are also different training techniques in this procedure. The easiest one is probably the mask this expression, so just mask out some genes and try to predict them using this model. There are also autoregression. When they predict the gene expression one by one or a few by a few to, to finally get the whole expression of genes in a cell. So the natural question we have is actually, are these ways biologically meaningful? And another meta question is that, does it really matter if those are meaningful? It's like not all things are meaningful in machine learning for other things as well, but they might just work as well. And this is more like an eye candy. This is because many of the results are very complex and hard to explain, but this is probably the easiest one. The left side is the ground truth of a cell type annotation task. The different colors are the different cell types. The task here is just to predict the cell types and try to make it as similar as this as possible. And this is a model called SA BERT, apparently a BERT based biological large language model. And what we can see is that most of the colors are matched, meaning that the prediction is pretty good. But we can also see some subtle differences in these big clusters, like these red and pink ones. And just over the last one year, there has been four, and I think there are actually more models get introduced, also using different architectures from transformer to performer, also have different number of parameters doing different tasks, and also train on different data. And they all find that their methods are good at some aspects and uh, might be a little bit worse than others on other aspects. There are also already meta studies performed on these studies, trying to determine what these models actually learned from the data and what tasks they can do and cannot do. And uh, they find some significant problems actually in this field. For example, the methods not always significantly outperform simple baselines, either in zero-shot learning or fine-tuned version of the model. So this is an example showed in the meta study. The left side is when you use all the genes to generate the embedding. And you can see what I've just said about the batch effect. The colors on the bottom row is, is for the different data sets. So you can see that the, um, the colors are usually grouped by these data sets rather than the cell types on top row. And HVG is actually just selecting the genes with high variance in the cells and just hope that the genes that have low variance are just noise. And we can see that this actually performed uh, 
relatively well already. The cells are clustered more by the cell types rather than the, the data sets or the, where the cell is from. SVI is a conditional VAE-based method. This is not a foundation model. They just train their method on each specific data set or group of data sets and try to mitigate the batch effect between the data. And we can see that this performed very well. All the cells are grouped by their cell type rather than which data set they are from. And the last two are both the foundation models get introduced recently. And both of them failed on this task. The gene former is getting us a big cluster of basically everything. And the SCGPT is clustering the cells by their data set rather than the biologically meaningful cell types. So that is a problem we have right now. And there are also other problems. For example, one study found that the cell embeddings generated by these, by these foundation models cannot accurately reconstruct the gene expressions even on the pre-training data. That's the data they've, they've seen. So this might mean that off-the-shelf LLMs do not fit the single-cell RNA-seq data we have, or it might mean that the encodings I just introduced need to be improved to bridge the biology and these LLMs. And another concern is that these models are not as general as the name foundation model implied because it's very hard to use this model to answer new biological questions when we actually don't have or only have very few labeled data for those. So to deal with this, people also come up with other different foundation models that might not be LLM-based. For example, the single-cell similarity model is just uh, a autoencoder plus a triplet loss trained on cell types. That's a metric learning way to do this, to try to find out a meaningful cell embeddings. And the hope of this method is to extract the cells from the atlas I introduced that have millions of cells, find the cells that are similar to maybe just a few cells in your biological study, and use those to validate the findings you have, because your study might not have the power to, to consolidate that claim. And there are other methods based on other different models, or even just with chat GPT prompts. And those are all interesting models to try to solve biological questions using machine learning. So there are some open questions we are really interested in. The first one is how to actually handle the unique noise in biological data, including the batch effect I just talked about. And we also need to improve the zero-shot learning performance. That's especially important for batch effect because every new data set will be a new batch. And if we want to study it, we need the zero-shot performance on it to be good. And we also need to know how to integrate multi-model data. So I talked about DNA sequences. I talked about RNA counts. There are also proteins and spatial informations, and those can all be measured for each single cell. And how do we integrate all these information together? Beyond that, we also have a lot of prior knowledge that are documented in millions of biomedical publications. Also, there are established knowledge graphs or databases for the interaction of genes, interaction of cells. How do we utilize all those information in a unified model? And a very basic question is that, are we really ready for foundation models in this field? We have millions of cells. We have very large data, but there are they are also of very high diversity. Is that data set ready for a large foundation model to be trained? We actually don't know the answer to this, and we need a way to answer that. 
So today, what's happening is LLM style models start to transform computational biology. But we still need more careful modeling to learn real biology. And we need more interdisciplinary collaborations to make this happen. People are talking about that the future will be applying large language models in biology. And the important things we need to do in the future is to answer unseen questions about a data set. If we give a model a data set and we give it a question it has never seen before, can't answer this. And uh, we also want a model to be able to generate hypotheses or, in a sense, to ask new questions, not just answer questions, because this is how science works. And this really needs a way to bridge the cell's language and the human's language. So right now, people are already using the, cell, um, the chat GPT to ask questions like, write me a piece of code in R to find the cell type we want to see. And um, people want to query it about some specific diseases. What are they? What are markers of the diseases? And people use those models to summarize biological papers, to read them faster. But in the future, we really want a model where we can ask it, here is the data set, and can you find some new knowledge from it? So this is just a very small piece of the computational biomedical research. There are also other models doing very different things, like BioBert and BioMed LM. They can be used to mine the electronic health record and literature. They're alpha fold for protein folding prediction. There are also protein docking methods, drug discovery methods, and many more. Here I want to thank my advisor, Dr. Jian Ma. I want to thank other contributors to these slides. Ali actually sitting there, and Wen Duo, who's in Pittsburgh right now. And I want to thank the workshop organizers for giving our groups the opportunity to introduce um, this topic to the audience here. And I thank all of you for attending. Uh, what are your thoughts on evaluating the generated outputs? Um, sorry, okay. <laughs> um, how, how do you evaluate the generated outputs? The generated outputs, that's a good question. So we have some labeled data in this field. For example, some genes are well studied. Those are the things we can use, like where the promoters are, those are predetermined. But we don't have that information to, uh, for all 20,000 genes. So we use the known ones to validate it and try to generalize this to more genes we don't know. And for the RNA, that's basically the same thing. We have some well-studied tissues. We can use those to validate the models, and uh, we want to generalize that to other tissues or diseases that are not well studied. Thank you. I'm not sure, maybe you've already answered this question, but um, so it seems like there's, there's sort of two obvious ways in which um, a large lang a foundational model could be applied to computational biology. One is um, you train, a, train a, a foundational model using internet texts, using all of the text on the internet, and then you ask it to summarize for you um, a, a paper that's been published in the uh, PLO, PLOS1 or in, in some, uh, some biomedical journal. Yes. Um, that's a, a pretty big domain shift from the internet to PLOS1. But then there's also the idea that I think you, you've espoused and others have espoused that you take a foundational language model trained on all of the text on the internet, and then you ask it to read through a genome and to tell you where the, uh, where the proteins are encoded. And that seems like an even bigger domain shift. And I wonder if you could comment on um, how much you could expect a, a foundational model trained on the internet to know about either of those two domains that are quite far away from the domain it was trained on. Yeah, I think that's about this question of how to bridge the cells and humans' language. And 
there are some works right now that are just trying to use those models trained on human language, pre-trained on human language, and directly use them to fine tune on those biological sequences. And they actually found that it worked a little bit better than freshly training on the biological contents. But I think what's more important is probably what you've just said, let the model to understand both sides of things and, uh, and answer questions on those biological contents. But uh, I don't think I have a, a definitive answer of how to do this, but this is really what we want to do. I wonder, can I, if, I, if I can ask a follow-up question. So there's this thing that's being done in, in, um, in vision language multimodality right now to try to create a representation of a particular visual object that is as close as possible to the representation of the semantically similar um, text, text span. Is, is, is there any data set or is there any way that you can imagine a data set that could do similar things between sequences of, of DNA base pairs and their comparable natural language descriptions? Yes, certainly. We were just talking about this this morning. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think there's an opportunity. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody doing this right now, but that's really an interesting thing to do. How well would you expect uh, these models to generalize from uh, like well-studied genes to genes that are not well-studied or known? Um, it's hard to say. The, the hope is that by validating the performance on the genes that, we, that are well studied but unseen by the model, we can get a hint of how it will generalize to other genes. That's basically how people do machine learning. But yeah, a problem in this field is that it's not something like the image or the human language Everybody can just look at it and make sense of it. Actually, even the domain experts cannot just look at the sequence or the big matrix to make sense of it. So I guess the answer is that we don't really know, but we are hoping that the training testing scheme will work. Thank you. Hi, so really interesting talk, but I have a basic question. All of these models, these LLMs are based upon this kind of left to right relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. But biology is related by evolution. How do you bring evolution into this? That's something I've never thought about. Um, I guess one way this might make sense is when we generate the embeddings, we can use the evolution information to, super, to supervise it, or we can do it in an unsupervised way and see if it has any overlap with evolution. Interesting answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.